So for section 1.6, uh, partition matrices, um, it's really not anything in particularly new that you've seen, except it's going to take something that's occurred before in previous sections and try to refine it for a useful purpose. And the main idea behind a partition matrix is if we would look back at what the heart of matrix multiply is, which was this idea of a row times a column. All right, the idea of the scale, you take a row and a column of scalars, so you take a row vector, column vector, and you get a scalar value out of it to get the single value out of a matrix. Now before on that, we could imagine a matrix that's say n by n, and a vector which is say n by one, could be looked at as a, this matrix can be thought of as a bunch of columns. So the first column, the second column, and the nth column and each of these uh, values of the column vector v looks like this. And so what I had was a row of things. It just happens that the things of the rows were, it's a single row of a bunch of columns. But in a way, I don't have to worry about like what they are. It's a single row. And a row times a column is the first element times the first element, the second element times the second element, etc. Except for this particular example, uh, it is true that the thing that you're multiplying, the, the stuff in this particular row, the stuff in this one row are actually vectors. So it's a vector times a scalar, a vector times a scalar. And normally we don't write them that way. You know, the, the typical way that we would write a vector and a scalar multi multiplying is to put the scalar first instead of second. It doesn't necessarily have to be that way, but it is the traditional correct way to say that you have a scalar times a vector or a vector times a scalar is put the scalar in front so it doesn't cause confusion. Another, a different way of looking at it, and so that's kind of interesting. It's interesting that I could think of a matrix as a single row of objects, but each of those objects just happen to be a column vector, right? But it is a single row of a bunch of columns, and that would make a block. A different way of looking at this multiplication would be to say, well, what, what is A? A could be thought of as a bunch of rows. And if A is a bunch of rows and V is a single object, well, this acts like a single column of many things, and this is a single object, and so normally we would have, what do you do on a scalar times a vector? Well, it would just simply go through each of those elements, and so we would have the first guy gets the V, the second guy gets the V, the mth guy gets the V, and when we talk about scalar multiplication, we're really saying this distribution. It distributes, but I leave it in this order because Traditionally, it makes more sense to say that, not traditionally, but when we have a row vector times a column vector, the scalar product, right, it returns a single value. And so I'll just leave that order there. And so we've been doing this before, where I think of A as not just simply a block of these AIJs throughout, but I group them. I could look at it as groups of columns or groups of rows and then deal with the groups. And that's important, again, to remember that when you talk about a matrix times a vector, that's two ways of thinking about it. And this is also true when you do scalar multiplication. Now, we're doing that with, we're doing that with vectors, right, for A's, but could we do it for you know, any particular thing. We're doing the same sort of stuff as if they are scalars. We do the same operator, but we're doing some sort of grouping idea on it. And so what we saw of A being thought of as a single row of things, and I just did the normal, right? First object times second object, first object, second object times second object, last object times last object. I did the exact same technique as if it was a normal scalar. Scalar times a scalar, scalar times a scalar, scalar times a scalar, scalar times a scalar, and then we try to do the end result in terms of what you see. Now, what does this mean for 
partitioning matrices. So what we've already seen already is that I can imagine or just apply towards a matrix. A matrix can be thought of as a single row of a bunch of columns. I have the first column, the second column, the, last, the, the nth or the last column. I could think of A instead of being a single row of a bunch of columns, I could think of A being a single column of a bunch of rows. And we did that as well. Now since it was useful, and, and one of the things that always happens, like, hey, this is useful, you can pause and say, well, could I do any partitioning? Instead of saying that I'm only going to look at these things as a bunch of columns or I can look at this thing as a bunch of rows, could I partition it into other values? In other words, if I have a matrix like this, I could go through here and say, okay, I have a row, I have a row, I have three rows that are involved. So I have one column of three rows. Or I could look at this and say, no, 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 I want to look at it as columns. I have one row of one, two, three, four, five columns. Now the question is, is like, okay, you're partitioning it that way. Would it also be useful if I would say partition it into say two pieces like this? I partition it into a two by two partition where one is a one by four and this is a one by one and this is a two by four and this is a, a two by one. In other words, I just simply grid it out across the entire system. Now, one of the things that I can't do is I can't do something like this, like a partition within a partition. That's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is to take the entire thing and partition it across the entire rows or across the entire columns as we go. And so I could have something like this. It's like if I was interested in having to say, oh, I want to have, two rows and three columns on my partition. And so I could take this thing and say, I want to have that partition and then I'll do this and this. So now I have two rows and so I could say that this could be thought of as the first row, first column of my partitionings. And this one here would be the first row, third column of my partitionings. And this row, this group here could be considered my second row, second column partitionings. And it ends up for this one, I would say, oh look, this group ends up being two by two. And this one over here ends up being a one by two. And so all I'm gonna do is just simply break this into gridding structures. Now, you have to make sure obviously that these are correctly sized blocks. In other words, there isn't any, you don't get to do things like this. You can't just do a partition partial inside, right? We have to go across the entire matrix, either column wise or row wise. And then we get to see that everybody gets broken down into smaller matrices. Now, what's amazing about this is all of the operations of normal matrices Scalar multiplication, matrix addition, matrix multiplication will all be the same, except the following issue must be thought of. You just, you're not free to pick any partition you want. You're gonna have to pick partitions that make sense according to your operation. In other words, as long as the sizes, this partition you make, actually match up correctly when you try to do an operator. And so what do I mean by that? So if I would take a problem here and I have a matrix that's partitioned and I want to add it to another matrix, right? One of the things that happens is what has to be true for addition? Addition requires that you have exact same sizes. And so if you're going to have the addition operator, that would mean that the partitions on this size side have to be not only the same partitions, and so like for example, this is a two by two partition, but not only that, the insides of the partitions, and so this has to be a two by two partition, but the sizes of their insides all have to match. In other words, this has to be a one by three. This has to be a one by two. 
this has to be a two by two. This has to be a two by three. Why? Because you add like things. This has to add to this. And so if you're going to add a two by two, it has to add to a two by two. If you're gonna add a one by three, it has to add to a one by three. So you're not free to just simply, oh, I can partition one and then I can partition the other one however I want. It's, that's not gonna happen. You have to basically take this and say, no, no, no. I'm gonna have to partition it in a way that if I'm doing addition, then the partitions have to exactly match. The same partition sizes like a two by two and then inside the smaller parts also have to match the other smaller part as they add. And then all you would have to do is just straightforward is if you would add, you would take this group and this group would form the new, so let's do it in blue. This partition part plus this partition part is going to become this partition part. In the end, is also going to be a two by two partition. And so if this one was a one, negative one, zero, one, and then I add these, I would get two, one, three, five. And then you would go through on each of these and make sure that everybody's the right size. Now, Addition is nice because it's pretty straightforward and easy to think about. Multiplication, much harder to think about, <laughs> right? So what has to happen on multiplication? So if I look at my first problem and I notice that it is a two by two partition, if multiplication is gonna behave in the same way, that means my second partition is not actually fully defined. If this is two by two, multiplication says that this number has to match this number. So that tells me that my other partition only has one component that's locked down. This if this one is two by two, this one has to be two by, and that's actually, there's no restriction. It could be two by any size. So I could partition, if this is a two by two, this one could be if I wanted to, for example, a two by three. And then when you multiply a two by two by a two by three, it will spit out a two by three result partition. And then it's like, well, and how does this work? Well, what you do is when you do the first element, you would take the first row and first column and scale or multiply. And so you would have the first element times the first element, the second element times the second element. And so you still have your A11, B11, A12, B, B21. Oh look, that's the exact same thing. But now this actually starts to do full, full, now we start to worry about, okay, well what about the insides? Under addition, it was trivial, right? If you partition, your partition has to be identical, right? It's two by two, it's two by two, and all the sub sizes need to work. Uh, multiplication is more complex because what happens? Well, that is a matrix times a matrix. And that is a matrix times a matrix. And so a A11, which happens to be on this problem, A2 by two, is gonna have to mul multiply B11. But B11, if it's gonna multiply, that means that B11 has to be two. Well, that tells me that my partition here is going to have to have its internal part where I write this line to partition says, wait, wait, I need two rows right there. But then I go to say, well, this is A12, right? And which happens to be a, here a two by three in this example. So that's a two by three. Well, if that is a two by three, that tells me that this guy has to be a three by something. And so that would tell me now that this guy here has to have two rows and then this guy needs three rows, which means that I can't just multiply anything. It's gonna have to be a five row object, which isn't a big surprise. If I did multiplication, this has five columns, that means I need five rows. But it tells me immediately that two of them have to be above this line and three of them have to be below this line is the only way for this to make sense.
The other is that these are going to add. And if they add a two by two, two by something, two by three, three by something, this becomes a two by something, three by something, then that these here are stacked on top of each other, so they have to be a, how many columns do you want? That would mean that this can actually be free to be chosen to be whatever number of columns you want, and we'll be okay. So what happened is, this row has been determined by this guy over here that I have to have two above and three below. And once you figure out your partitions you know, correctly, you can then do your multiplication by saying that I would take this matrix times this matrix, this matrix times this matrix, add those two matrices, and it goes into that position. But you kind of sit there and ask questions of why? Why in the world am I interested in doing this when it's not that hard to take a, okay, this original problem was a three by five. That means that this problem over here is going to be a, sorry, this is a three by five, and this guy is going to be a five by something to have the multiplication say it's five by 10. I don't know. It's like, it wouldn't be that hard to take a three by five times a five by 10 and get out a three by 10 result. It's like, oh, we can do that. Why in the world are you trying to partition? Partitioning is important in the real world for the reasons of be having very, very, very large matrices. When I mean large, it's not untypical today to have one million pieces of data, one billion, one trillion pieces of data. And if it's one billion to one trillion pieces of data in a problem, that would mean things like this. Well, what if I want to write all of that data in a matrix? So I make it all that data versus itself. And so if it was one billion pieces of data, that would mean that there are going to be 10 to the 18th elements. If this is one billion by one billion, then all of these elements in here, there are going to be 10 to the 18th of them. But if you have a 64-bit system, that means these are numbers. And a 64-bit system says that every one of these numbers in here is going to take eight bytes of memory. Well, having this much stuff for eight bytes each means that we're going to have eight times 10 to the 18th. That's a ballpark of 10 to the 19th bytes. 10 to the 19th bytes is going to be, to store this matrix, you're going to need 10 million terabytes just to hold the data. So you're not going to hold it, period. So this actually gets into, and like, oh, well, what if it's not that big? What if it's only a million? Well, if it's only a million, you're going to need four terabytes of data. And there's not a whole lot of systems out there that have four terabytes of memory. And then you would have the problem of, you know, if I want to have a matrix times a matrix, if I, if, if I have to have four terabytes for one matrix, four terabytes for another matrix, and then I need to add these two matrices to get a third, then I need another three terabytes. Well, what if I have to multiply it and then add it, and I have a fourth and fifth and sixth, and these matrices keep growing in terms of the number of operators? And that's just for having a million by million matrix. So what happens when you have data of this size is you can't do the math on a computer as is because you can't load it into memory, right? You need to, when you're doing these things by hand and it's something as simple as a three by five and a five by 10, you can write it on a piece of paper, you can do the work. I mean, it's not that big of a deal to write a program that will do it. But to write it in a program means you need to store it into memory or you need to store it on a hard drive. Uh, you just have to have some place to store it. Well, you might be able to handle storing it, but to load it into memory to do mathematical operators on it is not going to happen. It's just not physically possible. So what do we do? Well, instead of keeping four terabytes in memory, what you do is you take your very large matrix and you partition it and you take your next very large matrix and you pick an appropriate partition as well according to whatever operator you're doing 
And then when you're calculating the results of this thing, you don't load the entire matrix, right? This part of the output doesn't need everything. It just needs like this piece, this piece, this piece, and this piece, this piece, and this piece. So I will only load into memory the parts that I need to do this part of the end result. And then I destroy all that and load into memory the next parts to get the next part, right? And so this be all of a sudden becomes you know, applied to systems where you have lots and lots and lots of processors with limited memory. Um, like you can go ahead and get uh, graphics cards that have say you know, 10,000 graphical processing units. Right? So they have 10,000 cores, but they don't have that much memory. Right? So what you're constantly trying to do is deal with this fact that I'm going to take my matrix, I'm going to break it into small pieces, take this other matrix, break it into correct small pieces, and then only do the work that's necessary and then build the result using many, many, many different you know, individual tear parts. And this, this is the idea of being able to do multi-core processing. And partitioned matrices have this as a massive application. Uh, this is also true, especially when we get into the idea of what's called sparse matrices. And sparse matrices means that you might have a matrix, but that has, you know, 10 to the 18th elements. But if most of the elements are zero, all right, what happens under these operators if, you know, if we have a big O, well, which is the all zero matrix, well, what's the all zero matrix going to do to anything? It multiplies. It's just going to wipe it out. So I really don't need it, right? We just need to know where it's at. And so uh, there's a lot of current applications for partition matrices in the real world with dealing with very large data sets and very large matrices of numbers. And how to work with them when you can't load it into memory, you have to load it in pieces, which requires that. So as far as this section goes, it just really is the operators are the exact same thing as long as the sizes of your sub blocks work correctly. And you have to spend a lot of time doing study and analysis on an actual specific problem to figure out what sizes should I pick? How should I partition it? When do I pick small sizes or large sizes is going to be dependent upon, honestly, what type of computer you have. You know, the computer that you're working with is going to be like how much memory, does it have a graphics card, does it not have a graphics card, does it have physical memory, does it have hard drives that are really fast. And so you're going to, and what's my, what's my problem? What type of data do I have? Is it mainly sparse? Is it almost all zeros? And there's a lot of creative analysis to figure out before you even do your problem, which is how to partition it. But once it's partitioned, it's straightforward. You just do the operators in the same way that you do in the past. All right, that's one six.